So our next speaker is going to be El Kalai, professor at MIT. Please welcome her. Okay, so uh, I think what I'm going to talk today now about is something kind of between the panel and between what Sharon talked about. So it's going to be technical, but much more high level. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, succinct proofs. It's, uh, so I'm a cryptographer. I'm from Microsoft Research and MIT. And this is one of my favorite uh, topics of research. But I'm not only telling you my favorite topic of research, but it's actually very important. It has a lot of application to cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. And here's the problem that uh, people want to, to do. So suppose uh, you know, there's users in the blockchain, and they want to prove that their uh, transaction that they did is valid. Now, you can, you can ask, why do we need these proofs? So there's many reasons. But one of them is, for example, uh, some cryptocurrency want to ensure privacy. And when you want to ensure privacy, you want to give these kind of, you want to hide everything and provide what's called zero knowledge proofs, proofs that convey no information for the fact that you did things that you were supposed to do. For example, that your transaction is valid. And this is something that's used today by various cryptocurrencies, by Zcash, by Starkware, and probably others, but I'm not so familiar. Okay, so, so let's see. So how do we prove? So I want to prove that I did something that I was supposed to do. Okay, how do I do that? Uh, well, we can use kind of classical proofs, which is what, you know, mathematicians studied already in ancient Greek, okay? So, uh, you know, I want to prove that I did, that a statement is correct. What do I do? I give you kind of usually very, very long proofs that what I did is what I'm supposed to do or that some theorem is true. Or usually these proofs tend to be really long, okay? And actually, in complexity theory, we have a very kind of strongly believed conjecture that this is necessary that there is no succinct or short or efficiently verifiable proofs for general complex statement. For example, there's no way I can, I can prove to you, let's say that some program, an input x outputs y, within t steps is where the, where the proof is much smaller than t. So I don't have a general way of proving to you that a statement is correct or a theorem is correct or a program run correctly with a succinct proof. Okay, so I, I said that's what I want to do and now I say I can't do that. So I can't do that, but you know, in cryptography, you know, we have this kind of belief that there is no such thing as impossible. Something is impossible, you know, you, you sidetrack. So you change the model, you squish it, you step on it until, until it becomes possible. So, uh, so what's the idea? Well, let's not use classical proofs. Let's use something else. And this kind of brings me to kind of this notion, this really, really beautiful notion from the mid 80s uh, by Goldbach, Sermikali, and Rakov, where they defined the notion of zero knowledge proofs. So what is uh, zero knowledge proof? Well, the, the idea, what they wanted to get to is that they wanted to, to come up with proofs that reveal no information whatsoever about the statement beyond its validity. So I don't want to give you information why the statement is true, only the fact that the statement is true. That's what they wanted to construct. But shortly after, they realized, well, that's, that's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because a proof on its own, just the mere fact that there exists a proof is information. Now you have something that you can check and you know, it, it tells you the statement is true. This is on its own in some form of information. So it's impossible. Okay, so, so that's a problem. So, so as I said, what do we do when things are impossible? We, we, we bypass. So now let me convince you, let me show you actually that zero knowledge proofs are possible. Okay, it may be so actually convenient. Okay, here are two bottles of water. I wanna prove to you that they're different, that they're not the same. Now you can examine because I know secretly that on one of them there's a mark or whatever. I'm not gonna tell you actually, okay? But I know they're different. Now, I want to convince you that they're different, but I don't want you to learn any information about why they're different. Okay, so what am I going to do? Here's, I'm going to tell you this is A, this is B. Now I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm not going to look. You either swap or don't swap. Now you give it to me back, I'm telling you, well, this is A. Now you knew what is A and what is B, right? Because you knew, I told this is A, this is B. If you didn't swap, 
then you know that this is still a few swaps. So you know. So the fact that I'm guessing correctly doesn't give you any information. However, if we repeat it many, many times, let's say k times, and each time I'm correct, then you're pretty convinced that I know that there's a difference. So here's an example. I managed to convince you that they're different. You didn't learn anything. OK, so it is possible. So why, 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 why is it possible? Why didn't you learn anything? The reason you didn't learn anything is because I changed the model of the proof. What I did, and that's, what, that's their idea, I used the power of interaction. So now, the prover and verifier, P stands for prover, V for verifier, the prover doesn't just send a one-shot proof. I didn't just kind of give you a one-shot proof uh, writing down why they're different. Rather, it was an interactive process. Okay, I gave you the bottles, you decide whether to change or not, you gave them back, I guessed. Moreover, very, very importantly to this model, the verifier tossed coins. So in this example, let's say, either you swapped or you didn't swap with probability half. And of course, I should know if you swapped or not because then I can cheat. Okay, if I know whether you swapped or not, I cannot know, I, I can think the bottles are exactly the same, but I'll be able to kind of convince you. So we're really using the fact that the verifier tosses coins, that the prover ahead of time is not aware of what these coins are gonna be, and the power of interaction. Okay, and what was shown shortly after uh, this was introduced, this idea was introduced, that actually every statement that has an interactive proof, that has a kind of an efficient interactive proof can be converted to a zero knowledge one. So there's a way of very efficiently taking a proof and making it zero knowledge. A caveat here, assuming one-way functions, which is a minimal cryptographic primitive, like assuming hash functions for those who are not familiar. Uh, but under a very mild cryptographic assumption, this is possible. Okay, great. So, okay, so, so now we have interactive proofs. Turns out that these, forget about now zero knowledge for a second, turns out these interactive proofs are wonderful, even if you don't care about hiding anything, because they're much more efficient. And let me give you an example. Take, for example, a chessboard configuration. Suppose I want to prove to you that the black player has, here has a winning strategy. Okay, how do I prove that he has a winning strategy? Well, with a classical proof, it's going to be very long. The only way I know how to do it is to essentially I need to show you, well, for every move of the white, there's a move of the black, so for every move of the white, there blah, 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 so that the end, no matter what, the black player wins. It's gonna be kind of an exponential tree. It's gonna be a very long proof. However, it turns out that with an interactive proof, I can do it very efficiently. And more, uh, the general theorem here says that actually, I can, any, any uh, computation that requires a short amount of space to compute, you can prove where the verifier runtime depends on the space of the computation, not on the time. So in other words, if you, if you want to prove the correctness of a computation, and this computation you can do it while using small amount of space, then you can prove the correctness of the computation to a verifier whose runtime is essentially the space of the computation. So you should think in mind, for example, take a computation that takes a really long time, but it's very space, space efficient. Now we can, what this says is there's, there's an interactive proof for this computation. I can convince you that this computation is correct, where the verifier's runtime is only the space, which is small. So it shows, okay, so we do have succinct proofs, at least in some regime where the, for small space computations, for example. Okay, so this, was, this is a beautiful result. However, what I want to focus, point to is that all these results from the mid-80s, usually the focus was the efficiency of the verifier. The verifier should be very efficient. And of course it should be very efficient, that's the point. However, there was no emphasis whatsoever on the prover's efficiency. So the prover can be all powerful. Now, true, the prover usually think of him as more powerful than the verifier, However, all powerful is a bit problematic because in our real world, you know, nobody's all powerful, you know, not even Google, right? So, so it's a bit of a problem. And actually these protocols, if you open them up and look, they're grossly inefficient. The prover's runtime 
is like two to the space squared. So even if you think of very space efficient, like log space computations, the runt of the prover here is humongous, and so you can't really use them. It's very nice kind of theoretical results, but they're really not, not, cannot be used. Okay, so this kind of led us to the question, uh, to embark on the question of, can, do there exist what we call doubly efficient proofs? So what is a doubly efficient proof? Yes, we want the verifier to be very, very efficient, like before. But we want the prover's overhead not to be too much, okay? So the prover, yes, he should, let's say, do the computation. So for example, suppose I want to prove to you that a program on input x outputs one within t steps, then of course I need to run, to prove it, I need to run in time at least t, let's say poly t, but not more than that, not exponential in t, okay? So the prover, ideally we want the prover on them to be more or less the time it takes to compute, maybe with a little bit overhead, and the verifier should be very efficient. And then the idea, so, so that's kind of what we want to do, and we construct such a, a protocol for, uh, so our protocol is indeed efficient, but only for depth-bounded computations. So let, let me explain. So take a, let's say, let's say I want to prove to you that some function or some program and input x outputs one. Okay, but I want to think of this function when I write it as a kind of a circuit, you know, an and, and like the and or operations or plus and multiplication if you like to think of arithmetics. I want if, let's write this circuit and I want to think of it as kind of a shallow circuit. If you can write it as a shallow circuit where the number of layers is small, then I have an efficient uh, uh, protocol that convinces you that indeed on input x, the output is one, where the verifier runs in time that depends on the depth of the computation, and the prover essentially runs in time that depends on the size of the computation. And often, the size can be even exponentially larger than the depth, okay? So th there's a, can be a, this is interesting when there's a big gap between the size and the depth. Okay, so actually I don't wanna say, say much more about how this protocol works, works, but it's a simple protocol. Uh, I just want to say it works kind of uh, layer by layer. So suppose I'm a prover, I want to convince you that the output is one. What I do, I run this entire computation in my head. I kind of encode each layer using some encoding scheme, which I don't want to get into. And then what we essentially do, we run a lot of small local protocols where, I, where each local protocol, for example, says, well, if the output is not one, if I cheated, then when I go one layer down, I convince you that at some random point, what's noted there as V value in, of layer D minus one, that that value will also be probably incorrect. So if I cheated above, we're gonna go down layer, 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 and I have the guarantee that if I cheated above, the value that I'm, I promise in layer below will also probably be false. And then we continue, and I argue that if VD minus one was the wrong, la the wrong label, the wrong value, then also VD minus two will be. That's kind of what this little protocol promises you, and we go all the way down till the bottom, and then we get the guarantee that also the, the value V1 was probably incorrect, and this is a value that the verifier can compute on its own, it's just an encoding of its input, which he knows what it is. So it's not important that you uh, followed it, just the point is it's just kind of a layer by layer protocol and each little protocol of local correctness is a very simple algebraic protocol which I'm not gonna get into. For those of you who are familiar, probably very few, but it's a sum check protocol essentially. Okay, so, so this is, uh, that's kind of the protocol. Um, so the guarantee is if the output is incorrect and with high probability V1, the value at the Input layer is incorrect, and this is something the verifier can compute, can check on his own. Okay, actually the details are not important. The important thing is, it's a pretty simple protocol that has been implemented quite a bit, and, and okay, so now we want to use it on the blockchains. Okay, so, uh, okay, so let's try to use it. What's the problem? The problem, so let's step back for a second. And we said, what, we said oh, we can't use classical proofs because they tend to be too long, we want succinct, efficiently verifiable proofs. So what did we do? We went to the interactive setting. But how, did, 
how do we prove, uh, how do you use interaction on the blockchain? And the blockchain, what we want, I want to publish a proof. So when I, you know, let's say I put a transaction, let's say I want to hide it so I encrypt it, or I want to give, I want to just write there a proof that everybody can verify that this transaction was valid. There is no, what am I, who am I interacting with? So, so that, that's a problem, okay. And now this is where, uh, okay, so, so the problems that are succinct proofs are interactive. That's by necessity almost because if you just go to classical proofs, we kind of believe it's impossible. So this is a problem. And this is where the crypto magic comes in. So all these proofs use crypto magic in them. One way of eliminating interaction, that's just one option, there's various, but this is kind of the most famous one, is we can eliminate, eliminate interaction by using what's called the Fiat Shamir paradigm. So let me just say a word about the Fiat Shamir paradigm. It's a beautiful paradigm. And here's what it says. It says the following, take any interactive protocol and assume, take one where the verifier's messages are just kind of random bits, okay? Which is the case in the GKR protocol that I showed you. Many protocols actually that we use have this property, that the verifier's messages are just random bits. It's kind of, also the, the, uh, the zero knowledge protocol that I just showed you with the water bottles, your, 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 it's also kind of, uh, you can think of it as a random, random bit protocol, uh, where the verified message is a random bit. Okay, anyway, take such a protocol. Now, how do I convert it? How do I eliminate interaction from it? So he, the idea is use a hash function. And here is their idea. So convert it to a, essentially a two message, but you can think of it as non-interactive if the hash function is fixed. The verified FS stands for Fiat Shamir. So the verifier sends a hash function, but you can think of the hash function as fixed, in which case it's not sent, okay? There's a fixed hash function. And now the prover, the proof, is actually gonna be all the transcript. So the prover gives everything, M0, R1, M1, R2, M2, R3, M, all of it. But he cannot choose the Rs on its own. That will be completely insecure, not sound. He can, he can cheat. If he can choose the Rs on its own, he can cheat. Instead, we force the prover. So the Rs are supposed to come for the verifier. How is the prover supposed to compute the R? Each R should be the hash of the communication of the transcript so far. In other words, Ri is a hash of M M0, R1, M1, but up to Ri min, Ri minus one, Mi minus one. So it's just a hash of all the communication so far. So the, the, the prover essentially computes R, the verifier, the RI, the verifier's message, uh, messages on his own, but his hands are tied. He can't really choose them. These, these messages are just hash of the, of the communication so far. And so now it's completely non-interactive. If the hash is fixed, you can choose the hash, which is, I don't know, SHA-256, your favorite hash function. Now the, mess, the proof is just the entire transcript where the R's are computed as hash of the communication so far, of the transcript so far. That's it. And the verifier accepts if, that, if the RIs are computed like they should be and the transcript is accepting. Okay, so we reduced interaction. Now it's, it's not interactive and now we can use it. That's essentially a, the idea. One point I wanna emphasize, you can ask, well, okay, this is a very nice idea, but is it sound? Maybe now you can cheat. You know, we knew that if it's interactive and so on, it was sound, but now, this is a nice kind of paradigm, a nice idea, but how do you know that you cannot cheat? And actually, we don't know that we cannot cheat. It's, it's still a heuristic, I would say. There's a lot of papers on it trying to prove that it's secure. We actually have some proofs of security under some assumptions, but it's not like a security against all powerful uh, attackers. So a prover who runs an exponential time, he can actually cheat. But we do believe that as long as you're computationally bounded, then in today's real world, as long as you cannot break the hash function, you cannot cheat. So this is what we call the computationally sound proof, also known as an argument. So a proof is something that's secure against all powerful cheating provers. An argument is something that's that sound against a real world cheating prover, okay? Someone who cannot break the hash or cannot break the cryptographic assumptions. Okay, so this is a, uh, an argument system. Okay. So what did we see so far? 
we saw that actually if you take a succinct, uh, doubly efficient interactive proof and you apply the fiat Shamir paradigm on it, then we get exactly what we wanted, a succinct non-interactive argument, also called a snarg. So I don't know if you've seen this kind of logo. People talk a lot about snarg, snarg, snarg. This is what it is, a succinct non-interactive argument. Okay, and so you, for example, you can use the GKR protocol with the fiat Shamir and you'll get a snarg for what? For bounded depth, because our protocol kind of the verifier's runtime and the entire thing depended on the depth of the computation. So it's only good for bounded depth. Okay, but this thing is, is used and you know, you can say, okay, but are the computations bounded depth? Not always, but there's a generic way of eliminating the bounded depth restriction, which I don't wanna get into uh, in detail at all, but I just wanna say the idea is we can convert, we can squash every computation. We can take any computation that requires high depth and squash it to make it low depth. And essentially the idea, if you have a computation, like here's a Tableau of a Turing machine, for those who are familiar, any kind of computation, take your best, model, your favorite model of computation, RAM, I don't know what it is, um, what, and, and here's like the configured, there's the input X, configuration time one, configuration time two, and so on and so forth, and it can be very, very deep. The way we squash it is essentially we put all the configuration, the entire computation, we think of it as the input, and then we just kind of check consistency. And checking consistency is a very shallow uh, computation. So when it, uh, usually, I think when the GKR is used in practice, that's what they do. Uh, so you use the GKR in the squash circuit. Of course, now you can, you can raise your eyebrow and say, but nobody knows this input. This input depends on the entire computation, where did that come from? Okay, so yeah, you need to use some more crypto magic here as well, and I don't wanna get into it. But what I do wanna do in the few minutes I have left is to kind of give you a bit of a broader picture, and which I, I wish I had, I had time to tell you more about. And this is in general, the evolution of proofs in computer science. And I think this is a really beautiful, beautiful kind of line of work where, you know, until the mid 80s, where people thought of, cryptographers thought of the idea of zero knowledge proofs, for thousands of years, proofs were just kind of mathematical proofs that we all know, you know, just kind of you verify line by line, line by line, that's it. That's how it was for thousands of years. And then since the introduction of zero knowledge in the mid 80s, the way we think about proofs changed dramatically. So what we saw today is we saw, okay, there's classical proofs and we talked about interactive proofs, okay, which are more powerful. You can do any, you can prove any bounded space computation. But actually there are many more very, very beautiful uh, proof systems that were considered. For example, after the introduction of interactive proofs, uh, the notion of multi-prover interactive proofs was put forth, where multi-prover interactive proof, think of two-prover for example, considers the case where there's two provers. So the verifier interacts with two provers, and the two provers need to convince him that the statement is correct. And this turns out to be very, very powerful proof system or very, very efficient proof system. And intuitively, the reason it's so efficient is because it assumes that the provers do not interact. So the assumption is you have like two suspects, okay, that do not interact. And they need to prove to you, you know, that the statement is true, that they did not commit a crime. And the, the, because they're not allowed to interact, it's very, very hard for them to cheat. I think the analogy of a suspect is a good one. It's very hard to cheat when you, they have two suspects that committed a crime. It's very hard to cheat consistently. And that's what gives this proof system its power. The fact that you have two provers that are not allowed to interact. So this is a very powerful proof system. And it gave rise to the notion of what we call probabilistically checkable proofs, which is again a gorgeous notion. It says that I can take any proof and convert it into one where I just need to check kind of three bits. Read three bits. Okay, I'm not joking. Read three bits. And I'm convinced with probability one eighth, which is the best I can, that the statement is true. You want to be convinced better, read more bits. But again, probabilistically checkable proofs, PCP says, I can take any proof, convert it into one, that I can read only three bits from this proof, and be convinced that the, 
that the uh, statement is correct with probability at least, I mean, seven eight. So you can cheat me with probability one eight. And if you repeat, if you read more, then this probability goes down exponentially. It's really, really beautiful, and this gave rise to the notion of interactive probabilistically checkable proofs or interactive PCPs and interactive oracle proofs. The point is all these beautiful works together with kind of the magic of cryptography are used in these various kind of um, a, a implementations and can be used for, a, uh, for application. I believe that, for example, Zcash, who now I see is sitting there in your sponsor list, use interactive oracle proofs, I believe, but you know, these things are all used and implemented and it's a very, very successful and nice uh, line of, of work. Okay, well done, thank you. Thank you, Yael and uh, Toda. Really appreciated the talk. Um, nice and simple, too, my, my, my query. What made you use water bottles in all these nice little examples? Oh, they, they, I, I didn't know, but you know, they were just here, so. Nice. <laughs> it was convenient. That's it. Sounds good. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot.